this morning's guest, we're doing something a little different this morning. Uh, let me introduce Will Swaim. Will, good morning. Good morning, Scott. Uh, Will has about 20 plus years, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. Something like that. Okay, 20 plus years as a working journalist, founding editor of OC Weekly, launched the alternative News Weekly, the district in Long Beach, and is currently managed. Do I have that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you're good, currently man. managing editor of Watchdog.org. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about continuing adult education, uh, the quality of the state of journalism these days, what can work and journalists do to sort of um, revamp their careers, etc. But I thought we'd start a little bit by talking about the alternative news weekly format and sort of what got you involved initially in OC Weekly. And how many years ago was that, by the way? Uh, let's see. I started talking to the Village Voice. The OC Weekly is owned by the Village Voice, right. although the current Village Voice is a very different iteration of the company that I went to work for. And the Village Voice itself in New York was established in the mid-1950s by Norman Mailer and a bunch of other guys right. uh, who uh, some went on to you know, write novels and others went on to do Broadway plays and yeah. start New York Magazine. And uh, at the time, the Voice was started, and I think this is important to understand the Voice's start for a moment. I'll tell you in a moment why. But the Voice started because of the proposal of Robert Mo Moses to build a freeway right through the middle of Manhattan. Right? Uh -huh. It was going to just bisect the entire island. And when it did that, it would go right through the village itself and destroy what a lot of people saw was the most important art scene in America at the time, the, the village. So they started to write about just the politics of this freeway construction and then expanded to cover the arts that would be destroyed if this thing went through and the oh, neighborhoods, wow. the restaurants, the communities. And I think if you <clears throat> flash forward some 40 years or so, uh, when I was hired, the same sorts of things were going on in Orange County. It was a, in, in a way, we had <clears throat> pardon me, a, a county that had been master planned within an inch of its life by people like uh, the Irvine Company and others. But the, <laughs> the, the reigning idea about the place, even by those of us who grew up here, um, among those, who, uh, those of us who grew up here, was that there was nothing here, really. That right. it was just all suburban sprawl. And, you know, I, I kind of came of age during the punk rock scene, so I knew there was a, a thriving music scene here, there was an art scene, sure. and the goal of the weekly was kind of the reverse of the founding of the Village Voice. Our goal was to identify the art scene that thrived despite the fact that everyone thought there was nothing here. Right. So uh, I got hired in 90, late 94, we started the paper in September of 95, and uh, one of the interesting questions uh, on the, the board of directors of The Voice was, they, they started asking people in the county, do you think Orange County can support a left-wing, liberal, alternative news weekly? And, Is that uh, how you describe it? That's how it was described at the okay. time, quite certainly. Yeah, and right. I'll, I'll tell you about the evolution if you're interested. But at the, at the time, it was, you know, this is a very conservative place. It produced people like Robert Dornan and John sure. Schmitz and Richard Nixon, you know, All came of from those. Orange County, right? Mm -hmm. This is Reagan country. This is a place where the John Birch Society was really powerful. Barry right. Goldwater was huge here in the 60s. Mm -hmm. It was a very, very conservative place. And, of course, the Orange County Register was the major newspaper, which at the time was very, very libertarian. Very much so. Except on social issues where it tended to be very, you know, government-oriented, I would argue. They were really just kind of classic conservative. And you had the L.A. Times coming in sometimes, then pulling back. Uh, so the question was, could a paper like the Village Voice, like the LA Weekly, to right. which you know we were related as well, could, could a paper like that survive in a place like this? And the answer you know, from Larry Agron, of all people, the, at the time the mayor of Irvine, was you don't need to have you know, two, two million people pick up this paper, right? You just right. need like 40,000 people to pick it up. Well, if you can do that, you can win. Yeah. So that was our model. Can we find 40,000 people every week to pick up the newspaper and therefore support the advertisers who were in that paper and keep this thing alive? And we broke even in six months. Wow, that's great. And it's still surviving these days. Yeah, I left the paper in 07. Uh, the company was sold to uh, a Phoenix-based uh, alternative weekly company in right. 05. You know, uh, we talked earlier over coffee the fact that uh, when I was going to college up in Northern California, I also worked for an alternative news weekly. And back then... Uh, it was just a great time for me as a journalist, right? Working in this environment where you would research and investigate and write what I felt were compelling stories. Uh, we did a piece on a neo-Nazi group up there where the leader of that group ended up committing murder. Uh, they did stories for that particular publication on pesticides that were killing animals, sexual harassment cases on campus, 
all sorts of this type of journalism yeah. that everybody sort of uh, gravitated toward. Was there a bit of that philosophy in the starting of or the founding of OC Weekly that it was also going to be sort of a heavy-hitting, hardcore, journalistic sort of style of writing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the great thing about the Weekly was that I was able to pick up reporters from other papers who just really didn't fit where they were. So Jim Washburn, who wrote for the LA Times, was one of the funniest, smartest guys I'd ever read. And I always thought, wow, if I ever start a paper, I'd like to contact Mr. Washburn. Uh, Mr. Washburn, who turns out to be like two or three years older than me, <laughs> and really is a remarkably smart guy. He grew up here as well, really knew Orange County, and was yeah. into the music scene in a way that very few others were. Yeah. Um, Matt Coker, who had written for the uh, the Daily Pilot, the uh, now LA Times owned community paper up in uh, Costa Mesa, sure. and Matt had been fired or sort of marginalized, I would argue, after he wrote a hit piece on Richard Nixon on the man's death. It's you know, it was poor timing, perhaps, on the paper's part, but Matt was you know. <laughs> He was ahead of the curve. Yeah, way ahead of the curve. Yeah, probably a little too quick on the uptake. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I found people like that. And uh, the, the owners of the paper uh, wanted me to hire my wife, who was a fantastic graphic designer. Mm -hmm. um, and she really established the way the weekly looks. And I think if you look at a lot of current magazine design, you can look back to the weekly around 2000, 2002. And that's where we were in terms of graphic design. Right. So we were trying to do a lot of different things. But at the time, you're right, Scott. I mean, the... Journalism hadn't yet been buffeted so much by the economy, by the internet. Right. Uh, for those of your older listeners who remember it, Craigslist was gigantic back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and it really just started gutting the classified ad sections of a lot of newspapers. But the weekly, OC Weekly had never had a big classified section, so that didn't hit us. Yeah. Um, I was really, I guess, fortunate or unfortunate to leave the weekly and then try to start up a paper just as the economy was collapsing, advertising was going down, uh, the internet was taking off, and nobody, as far as I could tell, nobody really knew how to deliver news and make a profit yeah. right around 2007 or so. This is the uh, the district you're talking about in yes. Long Beach, right? right, and, right. You know, uh, I'm going to back up just a step sure. here. When I graduated, I, you know, I grew up here in Orange County. So when I graduated, my first job was with a, uh, a weekly newspaper in North Orange County. It was the, back then, it was the Fullerton Daily News Tribune, and they mm -hmm. had a, a series of new weeklies they started. One year into it, I transferred over to the Daily Newspaper, and I realized very quickly that the Daily Newspaper wasn't for me because of that sort of inverted pyramid style of mm -hmm. writing where just a fax are up top, and I wanted to sort of stretch my wings as a writer, right? So I moved over eventually to the Daily Pilot and had the opportunity to do a little bit of that there. But your magazine really was about the writing in a lot of ways, no? Yeah. Yeah. Um what we were trying to do at the Weekly was stay away from doing daily journalism, right? right? I mean, the, you know, you have the Times and the Register. Yeah. That was their thing, right? Ours was not to be the newspaper of record. Ours was to explain this place to itself and to ourselves. So early stories were about, you know, why the Democratic Party couldn't win here. Why, you know, we had a gun manufacturer in Orange County who was implicated in a... Uh, um, you know, the gun deaths of just hundreds of people around the country because wow. they produced very inexpensive uh, handguns that some people considered like Saturday Night Specials. We wrote about those guys. Wow. A lot of literary journalism, in other words, right out of the box. So um, I'm going to make a transition here. One of the things w I was hoping we could chat about was what about the graduating college students who are coming out of a journalism program? What do their opportunities look like these days? Um, are, you know, are there the OC weekly type publications they can write for? How does this sort of online environment um, affect their futures, this sort of discussion? Well, I think the, the most important thing is the economics. That, as I say, first, the sort of the broader context is the economy is still terrible. Right. And nobody has figured out how to make money in journalism. And so right. the pressure, the downward pressure on salaries, wages for reporters is terrible. Um, on the other hand, if you're a young reporter and you're not married, you don't have children, you don't have a mortgage, uh, you're not paying off a, an advanced degree in law or an MBA or something, it's right. conceivable that you can afford to get by on something less. That doesn't make it right. It just means you have an advantage over somebody like, say, Scott Hayes or Will Swain, right. who really do have some of these other you know, costs associated with carrying on every day. Uh, and I think that you know, if you're a younger reporter and you're willing to do almost anything, uh, as long as you see the value in it for yourself as a reporter or writer, and it's going to take you where you want to go in your career, even if very, in a kind of an obscure sort of way, you can work. I, I tell people my first writing job was writing for free. 
I, I, and, and, and mine too. <laughs> yeah, sometimes not on purpose, right? Oh yeah. Uh, you, yeah, you start off and you write something for somebody and they don't pay you, and and or you know you, you just the understanding is you're going to write for free. And right. why why would anybody do that? Well, you do that because you hope that you're going to get some experience. I was in graduate school trying to get a job in journalism, and everybody asked me the same question. Well, we see you went to journalism school, you got a degree in theology and an MA in history, but where are your clips? And I would show them academic articles. Well, here's my study of Chilean wheat production in the 1860s. <laughs> and that didn't do it. No, uh, no, they no, weren't yeah. really all that interested. So I started to write for free for an environmental newsletter uh, in Irvine. And and that kind of got me my first gig, yeah. uh, where I was paid a magnificent sum of $12,000 per year. Uh <laughs> Well, my first job out of college... That was a million dollars in current dollars, though. Yeah, I'm sure it yeah. was. I'm sure yeah. it was. My first job, I think, paid $145 a week. It was yeah. a, you know, for, uh, for it a week sounds like the depression paid. when we well, say it that way. I was happy to get it. Yeah. I was happy to get paid to do what I wanted to do, right. you know? And so education, I mean, you have a master's degree in, I think you told me, history. It's embarrassing when you say that. I'm sorry to say yeah. that, then. You uh, have a master's degree. Yeah, and I have a master's degree as well, but I'm wondering, I always you know, pull out the Mark Twain quote, I never let school interfere with my education, right? <laughs> and that's why I'm wondering, you know, journalism really started out as a vocation more than it was sort of an educational program. Right. How important is the educational process to today's working journalists wow. graduating? I think this is a great question. Um, so let me say something provocative here because <laughs> you know I, you and I both teach in journalism. We do. Uh, but I want to say this, that journalism is primarily like a mechanics degree, basically. It's, it's an artisanal craft. You learn it by doing it uh, over and over and over again. Right. As a journalist myself, as someone who graduated with a masters in communications I did see the value of the education in the sense of certain classes certain knowledge that I acquired legal uh, issues ethics I think you mentioned the ethics courses that I loved as well you're not discouraging students from going to J schools journalism schools are you you would actually encourage them or do you feel I, I might actually yeah. I mean yeah, only in this way Look, f resources are limited right, right? Um, so you want to as an undergraduate especially or a, a a young person thinking, I have children who are in college, have gotten just out of college, and some are headed still to college. Right. And I told every one of them the same thing. You know, the most important thing you can take with you is just a lifelong curiosity about learning and thinking. Mm -hmm. And are you going to get that in a what's otherwise a vocational series of courses? Now, some of my journalism professors managed wonderfully to get at that sort of function, that critical thinking function that you and I are talking about. And that was great. But I can tell you that day in and day out, the theology courses where they banged on 19th century, you know, Kierkegaard and Kant and Hegel, and really made you wrestle with big ideas, or Sigmund Freud later on, yeah. um, that that was so hard and required a level of thinking on my part that I simply wasn't prepared for in journalism. Yeah. So I think that if, you, if it's a trade-off, it's, it's either or, it's journalism or history, journalism or philosophy, journalism or almost anything in the social, in the, not social sciences, but in the, in the humanities, um, I think that I would go with the humanities, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't study journalism simultaneously. There's just a lot to learn by sitting with other journalists or people who want to become journalists to learn how to do that. Your politics influence your reporting or your writing? Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think and this so is, that's sort of a counterintuitive to you know sort of the the objective journalist. Everybody has everybody has politics, and nobody is objective. We can Agreed. we can be fair in our assessments, and that's what journalists are. I hope all trying to do, and okay, good. quite clearly most of them fail. Right. I shouldn't say most. Um, many of them fail. Most journalists are trying to be fair. They're mm -hmm. really trying to get a, compl a complete story. But even saying a complete story defies what we know about human psychology, right? I mean, every one of us is a bag of conflicting impulses and ideas right. and goals and personal aspirations and unexpressed biases. And the goal of a reporter, I think, is to become really aware of what your own biases are and be very clear about those and to be armored against not just everybody else's BS, but your own. Yeah. So, you know, in my case, I just try to be really upfront about the fact that I'm just sort of mistrustful of power. I'm just okay. skeptical about what powerful people tell me. As we should be, honestly. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think that's what we're supposed to do. So, so, so watchdog.org, you know, we're back on that. It's a 50, what is it, a 501c3, mm -hmm. a nonprofit. Um, what do you guys do there? How long has it been in existence? How long have you started been working in, there? It started in 2009. I went to work uh, 18 months ago, and I got hired by a guy who some Orange County listeners will remember, Steve Greenhut, who was a commentary writer for the Orange County Register and is probably the most thoroughgoing libertarian I know. Um, he makes me look as he says, I'm a squish. I'm a guy who's, a squish is a person who probably tends to be more liberal, in gotcha. fact. Um, 
But Steve went to Watchdog two years ago and just announced that he's moving down to the UT, the formerly the Union Tribune of San Diego. He's going to be their capital reporter up in Sacramento, our okay. capital columnist, rather. Okay. So I'm uh, moving up and taking his job as vice president of the organization. Wow. Yeah. I mean, is this, I, I haven't heard this. I, you know, I announced Happened about was, a week ago. Yeah. Well, congratulations Thanks, on man. that. So that's very cool. So uh, Steve hired me because we got to know each other in Orange County, and I didn't trust him much at the time. You know, he was working at the Register, and he was a libertarian, and I was whatever I am. And <laughs> we were writing about the Catholic Church in Orange County, the scandal involving uh, the, the, you know, the priest molestation right. stuff. And... Uh, and about the sheriff, the Orange County Sheriff at the time, uh, my corona, we had been dogging, Scott Moxley had been following for just months. Right. And that's when reading what Steve Greenhut was writing about it over at the Register, writing with the Catholic Church and about redevelopment and about pensions and about the sheriff, I realized political labels really didn't matter a whole lot. I kind of liked what he was doing yeah. and we became friends. And so I ultimately left the weekly and a few other things and he ultimately ended up at Watchdog and hired me. So what's the what's sort of the concept behind Watchdog and how does that business model work? How does that it's, funding source work? Sure, it's a nonprofit um, and you know it, this is the big question. We I, you know, I alluded to this earlier. There's a real struggle right now. I think a really interesting one to figure out how to make money, how to produce journalism that really makes a difference. If you read most magazines, most newspapers, it's really apparent. I'm not talking about the LA Times, the Orange County Register, or right now I have in front of me Laguna Beach Magazine. Um, if you look at Laguna Beach Magazine, it's very clear what the model is, of right? Course. You write about Laguna Beach, you write about uh, restaurants so that right. you get restaurant advertising, you write about bikini models because everybody likes to look at the arts, bikinis. the culture, it's exactly. just very positive. Exactly. Right. And it's not about investigative reporting. No. And that's no. totally wonderful and fine, yeah. and you know, we need this stuff too. Yeah, it's got its niche. Exactly. And you can see how something like this can make money. But how do you make money going after powerful people? Right. Um, when I was at, when we started the district in 2007 up in Long Beach, I brought a bunch of investigative reporters with me from OC Weekly. And the first thing we did was just launch an all-out assault on corruption at City Hall, and you know looked at people who were basically just making huge money off the uh, off the taxpayers. Right. And it didn't go over well with people who were really powerful and really connected. And within six months, we had an advertiser boycott <laughs> uh, because we were, quote unquote, anti Long Beach. Right? Well, but that was, that, that was to be expected, no? Yeah, you, yeah. you expect some pushback. Um, and I'm not suggesting that somehow I was shocked and surprised, but my, my point is it's hard to make money in that environment. Sure. If we had stayed with bikini models, restaurants, and how great the city is, we wouldn't have had any problems. We wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been true to myself. My reporters gotcha. would have been miserable and put guns in their own mouths and thing would have died. So this is how sort of the nonprofit model works for your organization currently. Yes, the nonprofit model works, uh, you hope, uh, to create a kind of a firewall. So for example, in my case, I don't know who the donors are. Right. Now, most people say, well, you know, isn't that terrible that you don't know who's contributing money to your organization? I mean, that's terrible. How could you do that? The fact is that it frees me remarkably. I don't know whether I'm stepping on landmines when I assign reporters certain stories, and it turns out that there are no landmines because the donors understand really that they're giving the money in a kind of a blind trust almost, and that well, I'm the one who's blind to where the money comes from. Right. So if nobody's telling me what to write, who to write, who to avoid writing about, I'm free to assign any kind of corruption story I want to talk to reporters and let them go where their instincts lead them. Mm -hmm. I'm free. You know, so this is going to lead, uh, I think this is going to be a nice segue into our next segment. We're going to take a short musical break in about two minutes, but here's what my thinking is. Uh, we talked about uh, journalism school, graduating with a journalism degree and the value of that, mm -hmm. and how perhaps, you know, most of those tools can be learned outside of the classroom environment. However, with the new technology, with the new platforms, you're not only just a journalist these days, you're also sort of an entrepreneur, a business person who's got to figure out a business model to sustain whatever platform you're building. Does that sort of make, resonate with you a little bit? It doesn't just resonate with me a little bit. That's exactly it. Okay. And so we're going to take a small break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about sort of becoming an entrepreneurial journalist and the new digital media program over at UCI Extension. We left uh, the previous segment talking about sort of it's not just about being a journalist anymore. It's also about being an entrepreneur, how to build your own business sometimes, especially if you're a recently graduated college student, especially if you're a working journalist who's been in the industry a long time and find yourself out of a job. And what do you do if you want to continue to stay in the industry? Um, what do graduating students or working journalists who are out of a job, how do they, if they can't get 
a job on a daily that's cutting back staff. If they can't get a job on a magazine that's cutting back on staff, how do they go about creating or building online, perhaps, their own business platform and still stay true to their journalistic roots? Well, I think that's a challenge. And what you know, a lot of journalists have done is, uh, and, I, and I think this is one great way to do it. You can actually, people used to say, well, like, how does OC Weekly work? And I would say, just look at the magazine. That's literally how it works. You can see the business model. And you can also do the same thing today with online journalism. You know, the advantages of online journalism are myriad. And I do think that, though I said earlier that, you know, a, a degree in journalism may not be important, I do think that going back and finding out you know, how the social media interact with your media mission, uh, that can be helpful. I think having writing instruction can be helpful. I think that, you know, specific courses are of tremendous value. Uh, uh, very good, yeah. I yeah. totally agree. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't encourage uh, an adult in mid-career to go back and get a journalism degree, you know, right. at a four-year university or something like that and take on, I don't know, a quarter of a million dollars in debt. Right. But I would suggest that people, you know, take a look at the course offerings uh, in very specific fields where they think they need some help. Again, whether it's writing or reporting or, you know, interacting with City Hall and libel laws or whatever, that's great. Um, and also, you know, learning about social media because you really do have to figure out what's your niche, what's your beat, what are you offering to people that nobody else is offering in the way that you're offering it. Who's going to support you in this endeavor and how are you going to drive your traffic? And, 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 you know, these days you can almost, anyone in any community can create what I think they're calling these sort of hyper-local mm -hmm. Uh, sites right. where it's like a, a, a local community newspaper, only sure. now it's online, and you can go out as your own staff, take the pictures, write the stories, publish the articles, drive readers to your website, hopefully pull in some sponsors or advertisers, but anybody and everybody could almost do that if they're interested. Right? That's right. Yeah, and the problem with hyperlocal, the advantage, of course, is that you get to do what you do best in a very local environment that right. you know probably best, or at least know better than somebody else. So if you want to be the new Huffington Post, you know, <laughs> good luck to you. You're going to be right. writing about, you know, Lindsay Lohan, the birth of the new royal baby, um, and investigative reporting out of Washington, D.C., and you're going right. to be competing with hundreds of very well-funded reporters and writers who can generate huge amounts of traffic and therefore huge amounts of advertising and therefore dollars, right? right. So you haven't got that at the hyper-local level, but what you do have is a market that is too small, too hyper, and too local for the Huffington Post to really care much about. And again, that's how OC Weekly worked. That's how the district worked. That's how a lot of local media work, like Laguna Beach Magazine. You take something that is too big, perhaps, for you know, the LA Times, and you narrow it way down, and you drill deeply. You don't go broad, you go deep. Um, so, you know, UCI Extension has launched this new digital media program. They've got uh, various uh, samples of classes that they're offering that graduating college students, working journalists can come and attend online and perhaps face-to-face. -face. What's the value then in that education for those students who, or those working journalists, who find themselves needing some sort of new platform to build? Because as we just mentioned, they have the journalism skills perhaps, but now they have to find the readers, find the advertisers, mm -hmm. find the sponsors, wear multiple Ads. Right. So well, what's I the think, value then, I guess, ultimately, in, the, uh, you know, in a program like uh, being offered at UCI Extension? Well, in the interest of full disclosure, both you and I are, uh, you know, it, we're, we're trying to help these guys at UCI get this off the ground. And one of the reasons is that I think this is really important to not just journalists in our field who feel bereft and abandoned by the industry. The industry has moved so quickly that a lot of us don't, you know, know where to go next. Uh, so this is a place, I think, to come to retool. Um, what's the advantage that you again you really look at what you can do well most journalists who are you know my generation I graduated from USC in 1982 I went to work in journalism in the late 80s um, before a lot of your listeners were born probably so oh, you'd be surprised. yeah okay <laughs> so you know we were taught um, you know daily journalism and literary journalism we right. were taught you know how to how to construct a big war horse of a story to do multiple part series investigations. Um, that's what we knew how to do well. And so the question is, how can you recalibrate? How can you take that tremendous skill, which I do think is still important, communication is important in virtually every field, and if you don't want to abandon journalism and go into public relations or advertising, what do you do with that? So you go into a place where you're going to be in conversation with other people who have, who have thought about this or are thinking about it, 
and you consider what do I not know how to do really well? You know, right. what is the what's the relationship again between social media and my business model? And you develop a business model. That would be my goal for everybody would be to get really clear on what you want to do this for. Is it just avocational? Is it just something you want to do because you like it and you think it's important? A lot of great journalism starts right out of that impulse, you know, where people have just said, somebody ought to do something to publicize this. They start a blog and it becomes wildly famous. Yeah. So as we attempt to get the, you know, to work in the digital media program over UCI as extension, and I, you know, those who are interested, by the way, should just go to their website, check it out, see what courses are being offered and follow through with their instincts if they're interested. What advice can we leave with graduating college students or working journalists who may want to pursue this sort of entrepreneurial journalism model? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've done some research on this for my own class. You know, they got to rethink form. They got to wear multiple hats. They have to be not just the journalist, but the businessman, etc. What advice could we offer those who are listening? Well, I was, branch I was, out and get into that environment. Number one, uh, don't wait for somebody else to start your business. Start it for yourself as soon as you can in any way that you can. So how do I know I have a good business idea? Let's say I want to start a, a local uh, online publication here in Laguna, Laguna Beach, and I'd be competing with the other publications already out there. How would I separate my website, my platform from there? Well, that's a, very, that's a good question. That's the very first question you want to ask yourself. What makes you so unique? What makes you different? Why are you a different buy? Why would people want you versus everybody else out there? And it's the same thing with stories. Story selection, by the way, sure. which is why should anybody care? Or the approach to the story, by yes, the way. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, the first question I always ask reporters who ask themselves is why should anybody care? Yeah. The same thing with your business model. Why should anybody care what you're creating here? The second thing is find a mentor. Find somebody oh, who's done idea. this thing before. Mm -hmm. Find if you need help with your reporting. Find reporters who are you know around here. You know, this place is thick with with former reporters, <laughs> and and ask them. You know, right. the kinds of questions that you and I are discussing today. Ask them for some advice and guidance. Um, we got to make the technology relevant and practical as well. I, I, I find that when I have discussions with students or other journalists, working journalists, they are so focused on the technology that they forget the practical applications right. of the journalism. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got reporters uh, at Watchdog who we are constantly training in social media, and the point is to keep them, they have to juggle two things. Number one, the social media is there to drive, to generate traffic, and to create a brand for yourself. Good. But you've got to have something behind the brand, because otherwise people just move on to the next noisy parade, right? right? So if you're just shouting through a megaphone, people might turn for a moment to hear what you're shouting, and then determine that it's nonsensical and there's nothing there, uh -huh. and they move on. Have you built your brand? Absolutely not. Have you done the opposite and probably injured yourself? Probably. People may be less likely to pay attention to you in future yeah there's also the fact that you know I always went after my passions you know I mean when I was working on stories when I write books I go with what I'm passionate about and that carries me oftentimes through those lean times See, I think the opposite I think you should really? write about insurance and income taxes <laughs> no I think you're absolutely right uh, that's that's how I got into this was writing about the things that I love right and so as you write about your passions, you can write, I mean, if you pick up a writer's market, let's say, if you want to be a freelance writer and you pick up the writer's market, that's about as thick as a dictionary, right? right. If not thicker. So any idea you have for an article, there's a publication out there that probably would be interested in it. That's correct. Whether it's stamps or horses or plants or food or wine or whatever the case may be, working journalists, graduating journalism students, if they're passionate about a particular subject, can also create a platform for themselves online That's and correct. combine those resources. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. If you look through that, that writer's market, what you'll find is there is a weird niche. It's not just horses, but horse saddles or horse totally. yeah, yeah, exactly horse right. shoeing. So find the thing that you're really good at and beat everybody else at it. You know, So find something that's very narrow. I have a friend who's a mystery novelist, but also is a specialist in refrigerated cargo shipments and makes like 60 grand a year writing about refrigerated shipping for a variety of publications. That's wow. all he knows. That's all he does in that business. And he knows it better than anybody. Well, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I spent about a year as a, sort of an editorial consultant for a plumbing magazine. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, was, it was an interesting year. I knew absolutely nothing about plumbing. I'm the last person that wants to hold a tool because I end up usually breaking something. And who was your audience? Was it plumbers or plumbers. self helpers? No, okay. plumbers. Yeah. Real plumbers. Real so plumbers. then they're, you know, your advertisers there. Here's the business model. The advertisers are anybody who wants to get to a plumber. That's who would right. that be? Guys who sell trucks, guys who sell equipment, guys who sell new technology. Yeah. All of that stuff. And yeah. so these working journalists, these entrepreneurial journalists, have to th start thinking about all those, uh, all those platforms out there available to them. Um, a couple more things here. I wrote down, um, if you want to be an entrepreneurial journalist, ideas are cheap. I'll just get sort of a, a quick reaction from you. Ideas are cheap. Execution is everything. 
Wow. Yeah. Um, I, I think I would say that ideas are the way that you make a living. And that if you, you know, one of the things that Norman Mailer is famous for is ruining relationships by carrying around a notebook. David Sedaris, one of my favorite writers. Love now his, Me too. His whole, his whole family, including uh, um, uh, on blanking. Oh. Sorry? I, was, I thought it was Amy. Who were Amy Sedaris, about. thank yeah. you, who did Strangers with Candy, says, you know, when her brother shows up, when David shows up, everybody just shuts up, right? <laughs> Why? Because he's getting ideas. He's always right. getting ideas. So ideas are the start, and you're right. The execution of that idea is everything. So I love to get these pitch letters from writers who say, I want to write about corruption in Washington. I say, great, tell me more. Well, there's a lot of corruption in Washington. Exactly. So you want to be very specific, have yeah. your idea, and then execute. Yes. Uh, does quality journalism still count these days? <laughs> Ah, based on what? Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's a, that's one of the things that people have to decide for themselves as business people. Does it matter to you and me? Yeah, absolutely and undeniably. Are we willing to pay for it? Sure we are. Um, but does it matter? Are you going to get rich doing it? I don't know. I mean, you know, look what happened on the Huffington Post. It started right. off as a tremendous business model, really interesting politics. And then Lindsay Lohan, right? right? I mean, just lots of celebrity stuff. And why? Because that's what brings the eyeballs, yeah. right? So does the quality matter? There's still undeniable quality in there somewhere. But the question for every reporter to ask is, what's my quality? The, the people who like plumbing, for them, that's the quality, man. Sure. They want to produce that. I have a friend who produces a magazine called Working Ranch. It's for people who own small ranches. And it's undeniably great. The readers love that thing. Is it going to change the world? It changes the world if every reader who reads it and loves that kind of stuff. Perfect example. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Will, um, very informative today. Thank you so Thank you. much for spending time out of your busy schedule. I know you're heading out of town tomorrow, I think right. you're talking about. So I appreciate you coming in and spending time with us. Uh, for the listeners who might be interested in any of this sort of conversation, can visit the UCI Extension website and track down some courses that are being offered.